The pendulum of war had come to rest. The armies halted. Around the campfires, men were too weary to talk much, but they could wonder which way would they march tomorrow. For 15 days, the Allies had been in constant retreat. For 15 days, the great weight of the German armies had pressed steadily down towards Paris and the heart of France. By September the 5th, they were less than 20 miles from the capital. Would Paris fall? Hope waned and time was running out. Yet one man preserved his hope and made his will prevail. At the headquarters of the Allied armies, General Joff perceived that a significant change had taken place. The situation was impressive. Our front formed the arc of a vast circle enveloping the enemy. Thus, our fifth army was now in a position to make a frontal attack against the enemy columns crossing the Marne while the British army and the mobile troops of the Paris garrison were well placed to attack in flank the German forces which had diverged from the direction of Paris. This was the moment of decision, the moment that Joffre had been waiting for. Now hundreds of thousands of tired, despondent men must be halted, turned about and thrown against the enemy. From Verdun to the Marne, Joffre ordered his right wing to hold firm. The German second army was marching southward at some distance from the first. The French sixth army would strike in from the west. As von Kluck turned to meet this threat, the French fifth army and the BEF could march upon the gap in the German line. One thing was essential, the BEF must march. Once again, Joffre visited Sir John French to explain his plan and plead for British aid. And finally, clasping his two hands, in front himself, he turned to the to Sir John French and said, Monsieur le Maréchal, to la France qui vous supplie. Field Marshal, it is France which is begging you. It was so moving that uh, Sir John French, who uh, was awfully British, very unemotive himself, was so moved that he struggled with the French language once more. He couldn't get anything out. And turning to somebody, he said, tell him that anything that men can do, our men will do. We will attack tomorrow. The word began to filter down the line that we were on the move in the reverse direction. At first, we found it difficult to believe. But sure enough, we soon found ourselves recrossing the mound, and we were on the advance again. Well, the revulsion of feeling is impossible to describe. We, from being tired, worn out, demoralized creatures, we became what we were intended to be trained soldiers with the enemy in view, and off we went. The happiest day of my life, we marched towards the rising sun, wrote a British officer. It was September the 6th, 1914. General Joffre issued an order of the day to his armies. The moment has passed for looking to the rear. All our efforts must be directed to attacking and driving back the enemy. Troops who can advance no further must at any price hold on to the ground they have conquered and die on the spot rather than give way. Under the circumstances which face us, no act of weakness can be tolerated. 
Slowly, the pendulum started its counter-swing. The Germans resisted strongly. North of Paris, General Monnery's army was heavily counter-attacked and in danger of defeat. General Galliani, military governor of Paris, rushed forward reinforcements in taxicabs, the taxis of the Marne. The men they carried just sufficed to prevent a collapse. But the center was the vital area. Here, the French 5th Army and the BEF thrust forward into the widening gap between the armies of von Kluck and von Bülow. Reluctantly at first, but each day more certainly, the Germans gave way. On September the 11th, Joffre telegraphed to the Minister of War, The Battle of the Marne is an incontestable victory for us. And now, as the Allies reaped the rewards of victory, New hopes surged up in men who had faced the abjectness of defeat. Could the Germans be hustled back to the frontier, out of the rich provinces of France which they had overrun? Could the Allies stage a swift and shattering pursuit, back to the Rhine in three weeks, perhaps? Optimism spread its wings. General Sir Henry Wilson compared notes with an officer of Joffre's staff. Bertineau asked me when I thought we should cross into Germany. And I replied that unless we made some serious blunder, we ought to be at Elsenborn in four weeks. He thought three weeks. Vitesse, vitesse, urged General Foch. En avant, soldat, pour la France, cried General Franchet d'Espere. But General Haig, commanding the British First Corps, remarked, I thought our movements very slow today in view of the fact that the enemy is on the run. The movements were too slow. Broken bridges, tiredness, overcaution, brave fighting by German rear guards, all combined to slow the Allied advance. On September the 13th, Haig's corps reached the River Aisne and pushed up along the wooded spurs of the Chemin des Dames ridge. The ladies rode, running along the heights beside the river from Soissons. They were just two hours too late. A German army corps, released by the fall of Maubeuge, marched 40 miles in 24 hours, with a quarter of its infantry falling out on the way, and arrived in the nick of time to block the British advance. The Germans dug in hastily along the Chemin des Dames ridge. The British were unable to dislodge them and dug in also. The French did the same in their turn. The beginnings of trench warfare were now seen. On September the 16th, Joffre told his army commanders, It seems as if the enemy is once more going to accept battle in prepared positions north of the Aisne. In consequence, it is no longer a question of pursuit, but of methodical attack. Every attack was halted. The Germans counter-attacked to throw the Allies into the Aisne. They also failed. Losses mounted on both sides. At the end of the month, General Haig said, In front of this corps, and for many miles on either side, affairs have reached a deadlock, and no decision seems possible in this area. Joffre had already reached this conclusion, so had the German high command. 